Welcome again, everyone, to another exciting organic chemistry experience. So today we're going to look at uh, organic chemistry. We're going to start at chapter two, looking at uh, the way we represent organic molecules. So we are pretty much uh, looking at the different representation. We're going to cover some representation from general chemistry. Uh, to organic chemistry. I want your participation and I'm gonna show you whatever you learn, how is that applicable in today's life? So, you know, with the present uh, coronavirus that we have, the different medications and drugs that we have to take, um, that's, that's an application in terms of why we're learning organic chemistry. I'm gonna show you why that's important, right? Because everything that we, use the drugs that we take, the cell phones that we use, they're all linked to organic chemistry. Let's get started. For, so once we identify a potential uh, drug candidate, or we refer to that as a lead company, um, there are a couple of steps that we have to take to determine how to move this particular uh, lead compound forward. So one thing that we have to do with any potential drug candidate is that we have to identify what's called the um, pharmacophore. And that's really saying, what is the active portion of that uh, compound that's responsible for its biological activity? And this is where the medicinal chemist comes into play, where what they'll do is that if they can find a, a particular lead drug and they could identify the active region or the portion of that molecule that's responsible for its biological activity, they can make what's called analogs, like different minor changes on the overall structure and to see if the activity is increased or the activity is reduced, the biological activity. That way, if you have like a drug like morphine, maybe you could, maybe if morphine is too potent, you can make it a little less potent. So it, it reduces a side effect. Uh, and that's what medicinal chemistry is about. So where we can modify like the electronic properties, the steric properties in terms of size, maybe, maybe make it smaller, charge, make it more polar or nonpolar. And then uh, the next step is what's referred to as the lead optimization. And with that, um, what we're saying is that how could we make the drug more selective? And when I say more selective, it means that it will only target certain parts of your organ and I try to knock out everything, right? And then we want to also look at what's referred to as toxicity. And when I say toxicity, you know that when you take certain um, medications, you have you may have some adverse side effects. So ways in which we can reduce those adverse side effects. And in order to do that, there is a uh, a method that's used that's referred to as the ADMIT method, where any particular drug candidate, you have to monitor its absorption in the body, the distribution in the body, how it's metabolized in the body, how it's excreted in the body, right? So ad absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. And um, because whatever drug that you take, you wanna make sure it doesn't get stuck in your body. You wanna ensure that it, it's, it's flushed out through the kidneys and passes back out, right? Because if you have a, Build up of drug in the kidneys that could hurt you and help you, right? And then once that particular drug candidate or lead compound passes the lead optimization stage, then it moves into stage three, which is referred to as the preclinical and clinical development. So when you notice, like with the COVID uh, vaccine that you guys uh, are taking, they had to take it through what we refer to as a uh, preclinical trials where they would first maybe test it on, on uh, or like antibiotics tested on, on a mouse first to make sure it works that way and test it on a small subset of uh, uh, humans, um, persons who may be infected or not infected. And then if it passes that phase, then they'll, they'll do a large study where they have a larger amount of patients and they'll do like a blind study where some persons would be given like a blank, some person would be given a drug and just to see and monitor, monitor how effective that drug is. And then once it passes all of those stages and um, it's approved by like the FDA, 
on the Food and Drug Administration, then um, it's distributed to the community. And um, then there's also what's referred to as a follow-up study to make sure that for any drug that you take, you wanna make sure you have a follow-up study afterwards that there's no long-term uh, side effects, like maybe you may take the drug, it might solve one problem, but may cause another problem. So there's no uh, adverse effect, like maybe causing heart attacks or stuff like that. that but that's pretty much the, the world of uh, drug discovery, drug, discover, um, drug development. And that's what I do in terms of research. Um, and I'll be happy if anyone is interested uh, to learn more about that, you can talk with me about uh, if you're interested in drug discovery, just getting an undergraduate research experience in the lab. Uh, you need to do that because it really helps to shape your future uh, moving forward. So enough said on, on that as it relates to uh, drug discovery, drug development. So let's dive into uh, the topic of today. So here's a, an example of um, what I was referring to. Like morphine is a very potent, um, potent analgesic. And, um, but it doesn't work for everyone because morphine is given to persons who, are, who have very high excruciating pain. Uh, and maybe you, you might uh, not want something that's as potent as morphine. So you have drugs that have been tapered, like if you go to the slide above, you have like codeine. So codeine is like a milder version of um, your, your morphine. So that's easier in terms of the side effects or less. And then you can modify, have different uh, analogs of uh, codeine that where you could tune the potency, it could be a more potent or less potent or less side effects. And that's what we do as medicinal chemists. 